Young people, one, they're much more smarter than our generation was. There's much more learning opportunity for them and they are demanding in their own growth. They are not complacent or take things for granted. Today with us, we have Dr. Akhil Bhusadai. He is a gold medalist from XLRI 1972 batch. He's done his postgraduate degree and advanced diploma in postgraduate degree in law and an advanced diploma in training and development. Uh, he is currently pursuing his second PhD and uh, master's degree in anthropology. Uh, Dr. Bursarai has five decades of experience. He's worked in various HR roles with Unilever in Kenya and India, was executive director of HR, HR in Motorola for Asia Pacific countries. He worked with Shell Malaysia as director of human resources and Managing Director of Shell People Services Asia. His last corporate assignment was with IBM India as Executive Director of Human Resources. He is currently CEO of Akil Bhusadai Consulting. He is a Fellow of All India Management Association Institute of Directors. He is also the past National President of National Charity Network. Dr. Bhusadai is a visiting faculty at Berkeley uh, UCLA, besides Indian Institute of Management, he is on the National Council of CII, SHM, SHRM, ETHR, and ISTG. He is a keen student of nonverbal communication and is writing a book on body language. An ardent wildlife enthusiast, he, has, he is also a serious wildlife photographer. So, with you know, uh, I think. God has been great that he has put in so many qualities in a single person and yes. we are fortunate to have him on this interview series and uh, I guess the industry will be fortunate to hear from him uh, what he has learned from his experiences and we can learn from him. With this, thank, you, thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Baslai. And, you know, I want to understand and know what keeps you going after five decades? <laughs> a difficult question. I think I would have rusted if I don't do anything. I'm a very impatient, very jumpy uh, person by nature. And I like to keep myself busy some way or the other to stay out of mischief. So I think that's what keeps me going. And I think there's an inherent... The world is changing so fast around us. Sometimes I wish I was younger, not for anything else, but that there's so much to learn, so much to know, and so little time. Uh, very well said, very well said. There's, there's so much to know, so much to learn. And uh, uh, the, the, the rate of change only accelerated. It is uh, the available knowledge has only increased significantly. Now, I think about five, seven years ago, I was sitting with a few friends and I said, the amount of change that we've seen in the last 25 years, uh, what more can change? Yeah. And we were just talking about it and in a few months we heard about uh, IBM Watson and the AI and the ML and we realized that what has changed is very little and what is going to change is much more and much bigger. So acceleration of change uh, doesn't seem to stop, that only keeps going and therefore the quantum of knowledge available and learning available only keeps going. And now I, I think I'm quite inspired by people like you who uh, are going uh, strong and tough and uh, working still quite hard uh, uh, and that, that inspires me to continue to work hard and learn new things and keep going. And I suppose that, we, you know, this interview will be an inspiration for a lot of others in the industry. So, but where do you get your energy from <coughs> to do so much? Energy to study at this stage, to write a book at this stage, to be part of so many institutions. 
Thank you, Kansal. I think there are two things which uh, drive me, whether right or wrong. There is a uh, there is a amount of uh, curiosity which drives to know that I still don't know so many things, and there is a there is a big propelling factor. And when you hear about something happening new in the world, new in the world of technology, knowledge, and then you feel that, but for updating myself and keeping abreast, I would be lagging behind. Um, I think another thing that drives is the joy of sharing whatever little I know by mentoring people, uh, sharing experiences, especially with youngsters. And now for the last two, three years, I've been dabbling with uh, advising uh, SMEs and MSMEs uh, without any fees. Uh, right now, I'm doing only seven of them to mentor them uh, and uh, provide them HR services without any fees. Now, that type of <coughs> Activity uh, not only helps the recipient, but that's not the idea, not to be benevolent or charitable, but it also keeps me in touch with the realities of industry. And I started this uh, practice sometime around COVID when things were really uncontrolled in many sectors and the small ones suffered a lot. They didn't have a very little to their crisis in terms of inventory lack of orders, lack of business. And that time helping them with HR services on a voluntary basis was a big eye opener that I learned a lot about real life business challenges. Not that we did not have them in the past, but sometimes small, small things that holds up the train for these companies can be a big eye opener that we in HR, can we provide people solutions to real life problems and how? And big multinationals and big organizations have the um, luxury of a big support system. See, the SMEs and MSMEs don't have that. They cannot afford it. Sometimes they can't even afford a good quality HR person because of the cost. And then you realize there is so much to um, contribute in that area and make them uh, and touch wood out of the seven. Four have turned around the corner and become profitable organizations in the last two and a half years. So this year I'm now going to take replace those four with another five and the other three are still struggling we'll continue to help them in whatever little way we can um idea is to make sure that your little knowledge that i have and the time that we have is shared so in mentoring many students i have 11 mentees right now from different business schools and um, to interact with these youngsters is an amazing experience of renewing yourself so it's not all the time giving it's all the time receiving also so not, nothing should be misunderstood. Oh, we have grown in experience with white hair, and now we are giving nothing like that. We are equally beneficial to the whole interaction, and that's what keeps me going. What's your biggest professional achievement? Biggest? Professional achievement across all the stints with Levers, Motorola, IBM, etc., Shell, etc. Very difficult to remember one or two achievements, but it's a, in, I've seen a continuum factor, and I don't want to sound immodest, but I think my passion for working and interest, not only passion, but interest of working with youngsters um, has made a difference in retrospect, both to them and to me. Uh, I'm not a good boss to work for. I admit that myself. <laughs> I'm, I'm impatient, I'm demanding. I want everything done yesterday and I want my team to achieve the moon. Nothing wrong with that. I'm not ashamed about it either. On a very serious note, when you expect miracles to happen, they do happen. It's a simple law of Pygmalion. But again, you have to bet your horses on the right type of talent in your team. And that I have found by experience and a little bit of experimenting that younger people are more prone to take on challenges and do much better than what they thought they could do and to nudge them, to sometimes even push them. Good for them, good for the organization, good for me. And when I look back at all those people whom I pushed and reached heights that they were very proud of, that they reached faster, they would have reached anywhere. And um, when we look at our association, we still didn't keep in touch after many years. I still have friends from Motorola. I'm meeting them next month over uh, lunch. Um, they're part of my team, they've done very well. I'm very proud of that fact that they've done so well and they're so bright, they deserve to be. And then other youngsters who get an opportunity to work and be guided and um, get to work on the bosses who are pushing them 
is actually good news. They're not very pleasant that time. They they feel they will light about. I'm not inconsiderate. I wouldn't run down myself to say that I'm inconsiderate or harsh. But yes, I expect a lot of things to happen, and they do happen. So if I were to count amongst my achievements, so-called achievement, is to make sure that some of the people who I worked with have grown faster than what even they thought were possible. Yeah, I agree with you. Dedication and hard work is are, are essential components to success. And uh, the managers who push for that, uh, people may not like them immediately, but in the long run, they realize the value that they have. Prashant is a very simple principle that uh, if we as manager leaders want to be liked, it's very difficult. Um, I rather feel that I'm not liked that much, not hated, of course. Don't go to the other extreme that you can do anything and make people hate you. But you may not be liked for many things, but if you are respected, then I think the manager career has been worth it. And that respect only comes when you give not when you receive. So when you push people to expect and demand more from them, more from them, more from them, and they deliver, they're also surprised. And that develops them further. And though they remember those association years with a lot of fondness and respect and personal equation. I don't think those days of a hierarchy and sitting on the higher floor and having stars on your shoulders and titles matters at all. It doesn't matter is what type of developer are you? What growth opportunity can you pro provide to your team that makes you count as a good leader or an average leader? That is the reality of life today. And when we do mentoring to people, when we talk to senior peers, we learn same thing all over again and again. That if you focus on their growth, focus on using that, and I'm not using jargons, but exploiting their potential, even they may not realize that they are or not fast track and it happens. Many managers have done that and in neural number of managers are using that technique now to make sure that the team, team grows mm -hmm. and when the team grows, that is the reward. So if you were to relive your professional life, what are the three things that you will definitely do again? And what are the one or two thing, things that you might want to do it differently? Well, I, I think uh, certain things I've not done accidentally, but I've done it consciously. And that would qualify to be put in the list that I'll do it again. Working with young talent and getting energy from them to energize myself, I'll do it again and again. Because the young people, one, they're much more smarter than our generation was. There's much more learning opportunity for them. And they are demanding in their own growth. They're not complacent or take things for granted. They are very ambitious and realistically ambitious to say they can achieve something. So if you look at some of the startups, um, and some of them become unicorn at the age of 28. Uh, I envy them, besides respect, that how come I was not that bright when I was 28? So if I were to do it again, I would still bet on all my attention and uh, reputation on working with youngsters. And I would still drive them crazy. I would still make them climb the wall. Unashamed. It's good so for right, so right. for organization. It's good for me. It's good for them. It's good for organization. And all the intents and purpose are honestly in their favor. There's no hidden agenda. <clears throat> Second, I think what I would continue to do, thank God I'm blessed to have that curiosity of learning all the time. And it's not only my uh, idea that suddenly came up, I've had good mentors who have made me learn things that I don't think I was capable of learning. They've, they've done the same thing to me what I'm practicing with many of my junior colleagues. They've pushed and they've made me deliver. And sometimes I've been surprised that I delivered that. So I've climbed a notch above and notch above and notch above. And the same thing is what I find satisfying in working with. And acquisition of knowledge. I'm curious about everything that is going around for simple reason that there's so much happening, there's a fear of missing out. FOMO. So I wouldn't praise myself to say, oh, I'm very <clears throat> curious and to learn. I'm just afraid of missing out. Simple, a very candid language. That's why I learned. So in last November, October, when ChatGPT came in, I searched up and down for learning about ChatGPT. Frankly, Google didn't help. So I was coincidentally, I was going, I was speaking at XRI. HR convention delivering a keynote address. So I met some students there. Some of them knew about ChatGPT, others were struggling. 
I came back in a week's time. Coincidentally, there were two conferences in Delhi, and I met some students who were actually doing their final year BBA. And one of the topic was that they were doing was technology, and the IT technology professor was with them. So I asked her. Um, she was pretty helpful, but I didn't get a hardcore answer. So I, then I saw this three four students exchanging glances among themselves. So I asked them. I said, "Do you know a little more about ChatGPT?" And one of the girls replied that we use it. So I said, "How?" I said, "All of my assignments." Short assignments. I use ChatGPT. So at the tea break, I hijacked these four students to the speakers' lounge and gave them my phone. I said, "Teach me from beginning how to log into ChatGPT." And within half an hour, forty-five minutes, I had learned enough to start. Then the curiosity kept on going. The reason I'm giving this example that we are sometimes missing out because we don't know, and sometimes we justify to ourselves that if I don't know, it doesn't matter. And people who know all this. So I'm a senior enough guy to have two people who know ChatGPT and they can do it for me. Uh, that is very different than knowing myself. I may not operate Excel, for example. I don't know how to operate Excel, but it doesn't mean I don't know what potential of pivot table is. And I think that is what I feel all leaders must acknowledge that there is lot to learn. And if you don't learn, thinking that others will fill the vacuum. It will show. One of the things people respect, and I respected in my bosses, was their knowledge, not their title, not their age. There were young managers, young leaders who I reported into, and I had tremendous respect for them. I won't take names on this forum, but if that person was to hear, he would recognize who I'm talking about. Tremendous respect for young sir, hardly a couple of years, one two years older than me. But the maturity, the reading, the amount of knowledge acquisition they did on a regular basis, how they acquired knowledge when. Today we are fortunate. We have Google to go to. We have ChatGPT to go to. Go to any library in the world, including Harvard Business Review, and look up everything you want to know in one night. In the days when this was not there, still those people succeed, and I have a lot of respect for them. So I am my role model, not as individuals, but the quality they have. I want to emulate that. So these are three things I would still hopefully relive my life and still keep them. With. What I would not like to do is really. Uh, lose my impatience. I think I did need to be a little less harsh on everybody. Is demanding too much? Is good one way, but sometimes one must draw a line. So I would be less impatient. Whether I'll be able to do it or not, I doubt. <laughs> These are all manufacturing defects. But yes, one is conscious of this, and one must. But one thing that has never left me is to deal with respect. Whether I'm impatient or not, I've tried. Every time I've tried not to lose respect for the person I'm dealing with, and that has helped to balance out a little bit of impatience, not a little bit, a lot of impatience and demanding nature. I'm being very open here, Prashant, because at the end of the day, uh, all of us are not made in perfect mold, and many of us don't know our faults. And it, it's a good friends and coaches and colleagues and bosses and seniors and family members who open our eyes to many things. So we continue to learn to improve. Or evolve. If you ask me this question one year from now, the answer may be slightly different. Yes, yeah, sir. Right, sir. Right. And in your personal life, what was your biggest achievement or biggest learning? And when did that happen? For decades, I and mean, more than four decades, I've been interested in wildlife photography. We were fortunate to be posted in Kenya during my university stint. It was the best place for any wildlife lover to photograph. But it was not that it was because of Kenya. I was interested earlier also, but very little opportunity. I did not know photography, so I learned photography. And sometime I toy with the idea that if I had an alternate career to choose, I would be on the National Geographic team exploring. Now it's fortunate that I was my some of my works were acknowledged by National Geographic for their print on wildlife. It's a big thing for me. There's no monetary reward. There's no other recognition. But the fact that I could. Touch upon a little bit of the expertise that they have, uh, and I still go. I spend before COVID, I used to spend about thirty to thirty-four days, actually days in five six months in the jungle. This year after COVID, first time I have come out of my shell, and I spend about thirteen fourteen days in this season in the jungle. So once hopefully, and that satisfaction of being with nature to love exact and sometime in the heat of forty seven degrees in place like Rantambore. Uh, it's not easy to 
a dark person like me to be in the sun out all the time in blazing sun at 47 degrees. But does it matter? No way. Do I care? No way. Why? Because I enjoy it. And if somebody was to say, let's go for one more safari for in the heat of 42 degrees, 45 degrees, I would never hesitate to say it. Because when you enjoy something and your passion for it, it drives you on its own momentum. So I think my personal life, of course, uh, having a daughter who is successful, etc., is all parental pride. Touch wood. But uh, my personal achievement has been on photography, wildlife photography. I keep learning. So uh, I had committed to my Angeline, which was my coach for many years. Um, she's in Holland. And she used to talk about learn to learn. And I said, I told her many times, I can understand the English word of learn to learn. But what are you driving at and repeating this to me so many times? He said, enjoy the learning experience itself. Like when you learn cycling, you fell down a number of times, you bruised your knees, you grazed your elbows, yet you went for cycling to learn till you could ride perfect. And the thrill and the dopamine that gets released in you, it must also happen when you learn something new. So one of the ho homework that she gave me a life-changing homework and I'm so grateful to her that she unfortunately passed away in the COVID. Um, because every four to five years, if not four to five, at least five to six years, learn something you know nothing about just for the thrill of learning. So about six years ago, I enrolled myself to become a trained chocolatier. I love chocolates to eat, but now I can make chocolates. Now I knew nothing about compounds. I didn't know about temperature, timing, moisture. It's a complicated art of making good chocolates. But when I learned it, I didn't learn immediately, practice, failed. But after some time, and some friends would question, are you sure you made it? I wouldn't have asked for a better certificate. So now the six years have gone. Last month, I bought myself a saxophone. I don't know anything about it. Nothing. That is the thrill. I will learn one day. Not like Kenny G. But maybe if I play Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, I'll be happy. Now I found out there are no teachers available in Gurgaon or in Delhi for saxophone that easy. And one day struck me while we were driving with the family that this bajawala, bandwalas who go with the marriage procession with the barat, they play saxophone in that band. You know, it's colorful dress wallas. So one day I went up to their shop and I said, look, would you teach me? First, he told I was making fun of him. Then I told him, I said, why are you going to learn from him? Uh, fortunately, I don't have any hesitation to learn from anybody, as long as he teaches me. So he was thrilled, and I visited him three, four times. Now, he has taught me one or two tricks how to learn beginning. And I'll go to him again. Maybe in six months, eight months, I'll learn to pick up something out of the saxophone and practice. The point I'm making, Prasad, is that if you enjoy learning, Everything falls in place. It doesn't look like how old you are, what time are you spending. <laughs> These are some of the traits that we pick up, good or bad, is not a judgment here. Yeah, that's so true, so true. And on your point of youngsters, I think uh, besides the purpose that we set up this company to help thousand Indian companies, which is also aligned with what you're doing, uh, engage their employees to reduce stress in their lives and a million employees and five million family members uh, and get them to be more productive, which will add about 1.5% to GDP growth and job creation. Well, that is exciting enough, but I think I agree with you. The biggest excitement is working with youngsters. So my co-founder, Sadab Jam, is a 2019 batch and guy wow. and who's pretty much running the business himself. Right? I am doing certain functions, but in terms of the business development, delivery, managing technology, all of that he is doing. Though he is not a he is not an engineer, but uh, he's learned technology and he is managing the check chain. So I focus on new solution development, uh, managing uh, and creating knowledge base by talking to people like yourselves. And um, I also look at the overall strategy, funding, etc. 
so those, those are the areas that I look at, but operationally is managing the whole business. You like to, if you're not doing it, I'm sure you're doing a part of it, but add gender diversity to your portfolio. Because today, it's not anybody's favor that women leaders must be nurtured and brought up faster. It is a necessity of business. Shamefully, we have only 4% of women as the CEO of the top 500 companies, Fortune 500. 6.2% globally. Um, in India, it's worst. It's 4% something. I'm not going by data alone, but I think the potential of using women talent more and encouraging them and accepting their motherhood reality is not doing anybody a favor. It's a business imperative. And faster we realize that and faster you encourage people to make room for that motherhood uh, period and make accommodations so that we can use women talent more and more. That's where the future lies. I agree with you. So uh, our majority of the team are girls. And uh, now we have some real smart, intelligent young girls uh, and boys who are uh, uh, pretty much driving the growth of this company. And uh, I guess they're the future of this company and they're going to take this company forward. Uh, so that, that really excites me, keeps me going. And there's a lot of reverse mentoring and I learn from them. Uh, and that, that I can uh, kind of appreciate and understand what you're saying. I mean, that's really, yeah, that's really a big thing. And uh, uh, what, what do you think the young managers, leaders, and even the young guys, girls who have just joined the workforce, even as integral contributors, what should they be doing to succeed in their careers, in their professional life going forward? I think that things are not changed. Requirement hasn't changed because the decades have gone by. Some modification have happened in the priority. First of all, I feel that among the two or three top priority for young professionals to grow faster. Is, that is your question, right? How to settle down and grow faster in the career. I think one would be keeping themselves updated in terms of knowledge. Once they leave colleges and institutions and IITs and IIMs and XLRI, uh, books should not become four-letter work. They should learn continuously because what they bring to the table is not experience. We don't expect them to bring experience because they don't have experience. What we expect them is to bring a viewpoint, latest knowledge. And a viewpoint, because of that knowledge, if it's contrarian, I always welcome it. Because why call them for a meeting when they agree with everything, when they don't have experience? Second, if they agree with everything, what am I getting out of that meeting? I mean leadership team. So you can only have contrarian view or a fresh view if you know the subject, you know the latest thing going on. So one that would be. Second, I would urge them and encourage them to find a mentor. Find a good mentor. Learn from experience. Combine knowledge with experience of others. And the combination is magical. Don't do everything yourself. Be open to learning from any source, including a mentor. Let somebody guide you sensibly, but not lead you. And there's a big difference in my, my, uh, my dictionary. Guide is to suggest to you way forward. Lead is to tell me what to do. Khalil Gibran puts it really well in his book that the children live in the world of their own which you never think of in your dreams to even visit. They must find mentors who are well-wishers, who, um, who are really guiding them the right path, not leading them. I think learning and mentorship. And at the end of the day, one common thing is deliver. You can't do all these fancy things of learning and growing yourself and when you don't deliver what is basic. Your reputation is built on the amount of results you produce first. And then all other additions, qualities are nice to have, great to have, not only nice to have, great to have. But if you're not a good performer, forget all these fancy things. Go down on basics, go down on hands and knees and scrub the floor, learn to deliver keep your promises, and then your path is more clear if you adopt mentorship, continuous learning, etc. And one doesn't come after the other. It's a basic thing. You deliver what you are meant to deliver, then think of everything else. 
I think that fundamental difference makes a lot of difference to young professionals. And so glad that most of them are result oriented. Today's generation, you see their internship reports. They write as if they're working there for years together, but they've done so much research. Their mind is so open to learning. And most of them, if not all of them, deliver. So delivery first, self-growth, curiosity, learning habit, all put together can make magic. So nicely put, so nicely put. Uh, again, a corollary question that the young CEOs of a lot of companies today in India, uh, what are three things that they must do to help their businesses grow and become sustainable? First of all, I do think they fail miserably. They have setbacks. Young people, young CEOs are more risk takers than experienced ones in the past. Now, some people justify that experience as a tempering ground to say we won't take unnecessary risk. Justified. But many youngsters who are now becoming CEOs or CXOs have ability to take risk and that is in their favor. Sometimes they don't succeed. The quality that they have to, and I like the word used, to sustain something is to not to be disheartened with one or two failures. And maybe that's where mentors will help and pick up the pieces and grow the organization and people again. Uh, once they fall down and get up again, their chances of falling down is much less next time. And getting up faster is much higher. No business in today's world is going to success just because you put your money and mind into it and time into it. There's no guarantee success. So the best companies have seen downward movement, but they've recovered. Resilience. Young leaders have to build up resilience to take on bad times along with good times. Celebrate good times with vengeance and go through bad times with resilience. You will come out. And that self-confidence itself is so powerful and infectious that people around them will know that they are being led by somebody who wants to lead and wants to win. Sometimes that mental image of who's leading us, are you crumbling down with the first crisis or are you, have, you have the resilience and gumption and grit to withstand. That shapes the mind of the people around you, people you are leading and how the business gets revived and grow. Leaders have responsibility, verbal or non-verbal, stated or non-stated, subtle or very open. They send out signal that you are in the right hands. And if the signal is weak from the leader, people hesitate to follow. If the signal is strong from a leader, people will say, she will lead us. Let's follow. And that's all. Halfway success is people's confidence that you lead us in the right place. Very interesting. Very interesting. Now, what do you think the CHROs need to do differently to, to, help, uh, to help businesses grow and to help people grow? Because without people growing, businesses will not grow. Why do you pick on CHRO? Why not CFO? <laughs> Okay, CHRO and CFO. Or CXO. <laughs> but, but to address your question, I know what you are aiming at. The CHROs do have a big role to play. Because today, finance, market, technology, capital, everything is available to everybody. The only differentiating factor in any of these people are having access to all four, market, technology, capital, knowledge. Uh, is the people and CHROs or the HR function itself can make a huge contribution, building up a culture in the place of achievement, shaping the culture, making sure that you are seen as a fair employer, making sure that you are looking after diversity in real time, whether it's age, gender, um, thinking. So happy that some of these young CHROs are now experimenting in one company that had 42 transgenders. It's not easy. I was consulting with that company and the first, this thing was, uh, what about washrooms? Which washroom will they use? You know, it's not very easy to experiment with many things because there are practical problems in life also. What about the lunchroom? Will people sit with them on the same table? The answer was no, not many people join their table. But building up culture, awareness and expressing the intent of the organization makes a huge difference. And that can be done by HR function. Making sure that you recognize talent early in life and push them, forgetting how old they are and what gender they are. 
pushed them up the organizational ladder. You don't have to have grey hair to become a director. The people with grey hair or no hair should not have an advantage. The young people who are, and now what they bring is not experience, managerial experience. I we were promoting people with grey hair, white hair because they had um, ex managerial experience. But now instead of managerial experience, we must look for techno managerial experience. Just being a manager is not good enough. You must be at home with technology, whether you're in HR, whether you're in finance, whether you're in production, logistic doesn't matter. So much technology can be leveraged to make life meaningful for people working in the organization. And that's where HR can make a difference. So your question whether what HR should do differently, as long as they're in touch with the people, their charter is to feel the pulse of the people and not always sit in a 10 by 10 screen and replying to mails very promptly. Walk the floor. This is never outdated. It's never outdated. Anybody who thinks that people like us who are talking about walk the floor are from Jurassic Park era, that's not true. We know the value of walking the floor. And when you sit on decision table, you must speak like the voice of the people, like a union leader inside a board. I'm very blunt about it. You have a charter to honor and people interest is your charter. And if you become a decision maker's tool to say, because I've already decided I have to agree, then you're not living up to the principle of HR. And if, I'm, if anybody thinks that is a theoretical answer, it is not. Many of us have practiced it and we've been accepted as a voice to be heard. So instead of all these cliches about HR should have a seat on the table, I don't believe in that. My view is totally different. If the HR is not on the table, people should ask, why is HR not here rather than say HR, HR should be there? And have pride in your profession. I'm not saying be cheeky or arrogant, but think that your profession has made and will make a difference. During COVID, we saw the contribution HR made in every organization. There was a public sector, private sector, small, big HR people led the show during COVID. How many of us talked of empathy before COVID? Today, which company is not talking of empathy? Like your organization name suggests wellness and engagement. When did all this get into highlighted during COVID? And who led that initiative? HR. So never underestimate the power and the capacity or capability of the HR team. They can and will make a huge difference in transformation. I'm very clear. If I had to, read, to repeat your question, what would I do again in life? I would again like to start my career in HR. Wonderful. And since we are in the business of helping the CHROs and the CEOs and the CXOs, CXOs listen to employees and listen continuously, what do you think we matter should do differently to help CEOs, CXOs uh, leverage the human capital and sustain their business growth? In many ways. I mean, depends on the situation to situation. One, it should be customized. There's no off-the-shelf solution that WE, you call yourself WE, right? Or we. There's no ready-made solution lying on the shelf to give off the shelf. But maybe you can become catalyst to provide mentorship to find a bunch of experienced uh, business leaders, HR leaders, finance leaders to become mentors and sensibly match the mentor and mentee as a part of your uh, Corporate uh, social responsibility. Don't make money out of it, but facilitate. People will appreciate your presence there as long as there's no gain for you. But you will be more satisfied than financial gain to say that you made a difference. There are many people who are doing that. We are doing that. We did it during COVID with 10 of us, 11 of us HR peers were together to provide some HR services. The satisfaction was amazing. Amazing satisfaction. Amazing satisfaction. We gave 40 hours in three months. And people say, what is 40 hours? It's, it's five days. And if you convert that into commercial value of each of the senior people, as consultants for five days, but they were more happy doing that service than earning with the five days. So may I would encourage you to think in that line, utilize experienced people lying around, make them join you for a cause. <coughs> Excuse me. There is no shortage of those people. There are many professionals who want to contribute. We need a forum. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for your pulse of wisdom, and I'm sure. Uh, people across the spectrum will benefit from this interview and therefore the country as a whole uh, should feel the impact of knowledge and wisdom that you've shared. 
we look forward to continuously stay in touch with you and uh, keep uh, getting more uh, from you and helping the industry <laughs> from you more often. Thank, thank you, you everyone. Thanks again. And Pranchan, thank you for inviting me. And if there is a learning for all of us, show us where we can access some of the recordings of other professionals that you record. So we'll learn from them. But uh, appreciate your effort. Thank you for inviting me. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. We'll certainly uh, share a link where the recording of all the past interviews are, uh, are stored and broadcasted from. Thank you. Thank you again.